it's wonderful to be here this morning with ERA uh, and to see the association going from strength to strength. Um, of course, it's equally special to be here to interview Sarah, who, as Ian mentioned, is one of the country's most important economic policy makers. Uh, Sarah, maybe before we delve into the economic data, if I may start with a personal question, uh, could you tell us a bit about your career and the journey that led you to be the Chief Economist and Assistant Governor at the RBA? Oh, thank you, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, so, yeah, I spent most of my career actually in the private sector. I've always been a macroeconomist. I, I love economics, so I'll probably go to my deathbed still talking about inflation. Uh, but I've always, most of it, that time in the private sector, and I uh, joined the Commonwealth Treasury uh, just in January 2023, so I did a year there and then moved across to the RBA. Uh, and for me, um, in my, my current role and in my previous role as well, uh, serving the public, uh, serving the people of Australia, is, um, it's, it's an honour and a privilege, incredibly humbling. It uh, really gets me out of bed um, every day go, to go into work. And I'm lucky to have an absolutely fantastic team uh, that I work with uh, who do their best work all the time uh, to, to help me advise the board and the governor uh, to help them make the best decision they can for, um, for the public. So uh, it's a very motivating role to be in, an absolute privilege. Um, and I'm very lucky. I feel very lucky every day. Fantastic. Thank you, Sue. Well, there's been significant conjecture and debate, obviously, on the inflation mm -hmm. outlook, um, particularly following the recent federal budget. Mm -hmm. Um, I appreciate asking you to comment directly on the budget, uh, maybe a little bit cheeky, and I'm certainly not going to ask you to give it a rating out of 10. Uh, Good. I might volunteer one myself, I can't <laughs> promise anything. So perhaps we can think about this through a different but still relevant lens. Mm. So the RBA expects inflation to move back within the target band of 2 to 3%, uh, not until the second half of calendar 2025, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and the middle of that range by mid-2026. Obviously, this is at odds with the Treasury forecasts, as mm. were unveiled as part of the federal budget. How do you assess these forecasts in light of the significant changes in fiscal policy settings? Mm. Yeah, so one of the main differences between our forecasts um, and the Treasury forecasts, and of course they're different, we have different teams, we do our work independently, we talk to each other regularly, but we are independent groups, uh, is the, uh, the energy rebates um, and the other cost of living supports that were announced in the budget. When we put our forecasts out in early May, that was before the budget, uh, we didn't have advanced sight of that, uh, so didn't incorporate that. Um, and so we've had a look since, obviously, we've had the budgets handed down, not just federal, but also the WA budget and the announcement from the Queensland government on the energy rebates that are going to be available there. And broadly speaking, we agree with Treasury's analysis of what's going to happen to measured headline inflation as a result of those rebates. The ABS tell us pretty clearly, actually, uh, what the difference is with and without rebates in the, uh, in the headline CPI. And, and so we've done our work and, uh, and we broadly agree with that assessment. So that uh, will be incorporated in our next update um, in August. Uh, that's not to say that's mechanically what we're going to do to our inflation forecast. Every forecast round, we're considering all of the information uh, that's come through, the latest data, our assessment of conditions, what's happening globally as well as locally, all of that comes together um, in our forecast updates. And that's what you'll get in August, but that will include uh, those energy rebates that have been announced. Th thank you for that. So if we think about the latest CPI numbers, which have mm. been very, very much mm. hot off the press, so to speak, um, headline inflation is still close to 4%. And the underlying entrenched inflation is since about December has been around 3.5%. So are you concerned about how sticky inflation is and it's sort of its persistent nature in the economy at the moment, mm -hmm. whether it be through energy or more latterly insurance or whatever the, mm -hmm. the case may be, it seems to be something that is, you know, very difficult to, to wash out of the economy. And, and I think uh, Warren Hogan at Judo Bank said this morning that these latest figures are going to test the RBA's patience. <laughs> so on, on that basis, how, how are you thinking about mm -hmm. the inflation outlook? Yeah, definitely hot off the press. We got the April monthly data just yesterday, so uh, my inflation team are very busily working that through uh, their models and, and doing their assessment. But to give a, a sort of very um, you know, close and high level uh, take, yes, you're right, the board are absolutely focused on the fact that inflation is clearly still above the target band. Um, if you read their statement every meeting, they make that crystal clear, and, and that's absolutely the case. Um, yesterday's data did confirm that there's still strength in a number of categories um, that uh, we've seen up until this point that, that's still there. Um, and that coming together with some of the more volatile uh, moves as well. We saw petrol prices were up. We 
uh, expected that actually looking at the, uh, the daily data that you can get there. So um, clearly there's still some strength uh, in inflation and that's a, a key consideration for the board in their decision making. Uh, it, you know, it's one of the many indicators that they're tracking and that we track and, and that is reflected in the advice that we give. But yeah, I'd absolutely agree. Inflation is still above the target and then no argument there. So would you anticipate any changes in your outlook in, in the coming months or otherwise in terms of your current predictions? Uh, well, so we're, we're always constantly assessing the new information um, and updating the outlook and uh, that's the new data, um, it's new shifts in conditions overseas as I said earlier on and all of that comes together in our forecast update and that's why forecasts are always changing. Uh, and equally we're also um, cognizant of risks and how risks evolve as well and that's another part of the advice that we give the board. So everything's always moving. I'm very lucky in my job, it keeps me on my toes. Um, economics is grey, not black and white um, and you're never 100% sure how things are going to play out so we're always humble in what we do and, and, how, and our assessment and we're always alive to things changing and this is just one example of that. So maybe if we, we dig into a couple of the underlying sort of um, issues or thematics within the economy, mm -hmm. uh, particularly say, as they relate to the inflation outlook. Uh, so if we look at, say, the labour market and in the May statement of monetary policy, I think the direct quote was growth in unit labour costs also remain very high, which, you know, you would interpret as indicating concerns with, with underlying wage inflation or ongoing wage inflation. Um, is there an issue with the absence of sort of productivity gains against that backdrop of of what we're seeing in, in wages at the moment? Mm, yeah, so uh, so unit labour costs are, that's a very technical economist term, I can only apologise for it, we do like our technical language at times. It's basically the, the cost of businesses of producing whatever it is you produce um, in terms of that labour cost. And it's a combination of what's happening to wages, what you have to pay uh, a worker, uh, and any change in their productivity. So if they get more productive, then you need to use less labour to produce a unit of output, and so that puts downward pressure on unit labour costs. Um, you can, you know, wages growth of wages lift, then all other things equal, that will put upward pressure. And we're, we're seeing some really interesting dynamics through the labour market right now. We've actually, uh, we think that wages growth um, is around about its peak and is, is uh, potentially coming off, and we can see some components of wages growth coming off already, uh, particularly individual agreements, that's the wages that individuals uh, sort of set with their workers, not set by a union agreement or by uh, award wage or what have you. Um, and so that, that's uh, starting to soften. But equally, we are seeing that there's a bit of a productivity uh, challenge over the last few years. We had a big cycle in productivity through COVID. Um, there's been a rebound just recently, but um, in, in level terms, we're only sort of uh, getting back to where we were pre-COVID. And so it's, it's a bit of a puzzle. Um, I would say more generally in terms of what all of that means for um, inflation, the way we think about it um, is that uh, wages growth and, and inflation, they sort of have a, a more medium long-term relationship. They have to be consistent with one another. And so that's really where we focus in terms of that wage and productivity dynamic and how that flows through to prices. So uh, that's why we're very watchful of it. So we're very watchful of both wages and productivity. Obviously, we're looking um, and advising the board on when inflation gets back to target um, you know, beyond today. Um, and that's really the dynamic there. So we're mindful of productivity, um, and we'd all like productivity to be stronger. It means that living standards are getting better. That's a great outcome for the country. Um, and we're putting that together with the wages outlook and everything else, and that's how it goes into our uh, inflation forecast. Okay. Uh, looking at another big issue, and there's more than a few um, members of the audience who represent organisations exposed to the health of uh, the consumer and households more broadly, um, there, are, there are many signs, certainly from Corporate Australia and the listed market, that the consumer is hurting across um, different aspects of mm. the economy. Where are your expectations for consumer spending for the balance of 2024, and how do you think about uh, monetary policy setting in the context mm. of what's happening at the coalface mm. with consumers? Yeah, we, we can see um, that there are some households, some people that are really struggling right now. They're doing it tough. We can absolutely see it. We're consumption, actually, uh, we now have really good disaggregated data where we can put households into different income groups, different age groups, um, all those kind of uh, slices and dices. And we can see that some groups are really struggling. And what's really telling through the data for us is that the struggle is coming through because of inflationary pressures. Um, and so, you know, prices of things going up, um, you know, the wages are income not uh, necessarily keeping up with that in the last couple of years. And that's just really squeezing some people. And they're doing it tough. And we're very mindful of that group. Uh, we can see other groups of households where everyone's uh, battling with um, higher prices, of course, inflation. Some groups, if you've got a mortgage, um, then higher interest rates, we know that that's increasing your monthly costs. Um, and for some groups, what we can see actually is that people are choosing to save a bit more. 
Um, higher interest rates are encouraging them to perhaps put a bit more into your offset account if you've got a mortgage or um, even if you don't have a mortgage, you can earn a bit more on a, a term deposit or what have you. And so we can see some of that, um, ha that response happening too. And so there's people are spending less not uh, through that channel as well. So overall for households then, we think right now it's still pretty soft spending. We got the retail data um, last week that, that confirmed that, that still looks pretty weak. Uh, we are expecting a, a bit of a gradual pickup from the, through the back half of this year. We, um, you know, we do think that income growth will start, uh, start to outpace wages growth. We've also got the tax cuts coming through and they'll have an impact too. Uh, so all of that put together we think will provide a bit of support for, for household spending, uh, but it will take some time. We're not expecting an immediate turnaround and, and we know right now um, that spending trend is, is pretty weak and that's pretty clear in the data. You touched on sort of the difference in composition around um, the consumer. There's been some discussion recently about uh, the generational differences in terms of how people are spending, you know, particularly older generations, baby boomers, relative to maybe younger generations and, you know, their spending patterns and how they're seeing the world and the economy, etc. Are you seeing anything in that regard in the, in the data? I think it's more um, uh, really the way we're thinking about it is more a composition of what might be happening to, to your income and what's happening to your outgoings and what that means in terms of uh, your capacity for spending and then the choices that you make. I mean, and everyone, uh, you know, we all have our household budgets. I know I have mine and, and the bills come in and you work out what you've got left and, and where you spend uh, and what you save and things. But what we're generally seeing is that if you're in a you know, position where you don't have a mortgage, for instance, and you own your own home, then uh, you're not really impacted by rent movements, you're not in impacted uh, by the increase in your mortgage uh, each month. And so for you, that group maybe have got a bit more space um, in terms of their spending. Other groups that we can see um, are impacted by those things. You might be a renter and you're seeing you know, a significant increase in your rents when your contract is renewed, or if you're carrying a mortgage, then um, you might over the last couple of years, you probably have seen an increase in your mortgage repayments. And so that uh, then constrains your spending perhaps a bit more on uh, you know, other, uh, types of items and products. So it's more that product of circumstance that we're really tracking and thinking about and thinking about the, you know, how many different households fit into each group and, and the decisions that individuals make. So we'll, as I say, we know it's tough for some groups um, and, and we're really mindful of that. And we know other groups perhaps not as impacted, but everyone's impacted by high inflation. Um, and that's you know, a really good reason for the board and for us to be mm. very focused on it. I, one of the sort of, I think, contradictions in some of the data has been to a certain extent, maybe intuitive at least, business lending in many respects has remained quite robust. Is, is this just a headline and when you unpack that it's, it's a different story? So what's your perspective on, on uh, lending to, the, mm. to, to corporates and, and what that tells us about the different elements mm. in the economy? Uh, it, it has actually held up reasonably well. It did certainly went through a cycle through COVID, as you'd expect, um, but it, it's held up reasonably well, and it, it actually aligns with business investment trends that we're seeing. So business investment has actually been one of the drivers of the economy over the last year or so. Um, and what we're seeing there is a number of businesses that are seeing increased demand, and we can see there's some uh, positive uh, demand coming through from the, the infrastructure projects the government's got underway, other parts of government spending too. Um, and notwithstanding the softening um, in the growth rate of consumer spending, uh, there was a, a, you know, a strong rebound in consumer spending coming out of COVID. Uh, so putting all of that together, a number of businesses have found that it's you know, opportune to undertake some investment. Um, they're buying machinery and equipment. They might be investing in uh, digital types of um, technology, um, you know, software, new, you know, new, uh, moving data and other platforms into the cloud. All of these things count as investment. Um, and there's a number of um, uh, construction projects that are underway as well, and you, you know, quite a few different office blocks, um, warehousing, data centers, things like this that are also being built across the economy. So all of that counts as business investment and we can see that activity. And of course, some of that, um, you know, it's fairly typical for businesses to potentially take on some debt to, uh, to fund that. Great. Um, I'd like to talk about a few of the longer range issues that mm. are happening within business and more broadly in society and how the RBA thinks about those in terms of longer range, medium term mm. policy setting. Before I do that, maybe, you know, given that we've talked through you know, wages, productivity, um, household, consumer, business lending, mm. two questions, if I may. What, what's the data that you're most focused on? What are the data points you're most focused on at the moment? And then maybe secondly, what, what is keeping you awake at night? Mm. Maybe the same answer. But, um, <laughs> 
Uh, wow, well, goodness. I mean, uh, as a macroeconomist, and I love love my job. Um, I'm data hungry. I look at pretty much everything all the time. But um, obviously, the, the you know some of those core indicators for the economy: what's happening uh, with inflation, the labour market. We get the National Accounts data next week, which is our holistic read on demand. So uh, not just households, but businesses, government, uh, and exports as well. Uh, so all of those types of indicators definitely focused on. And we're very lucky these days as economists, there's so much more data uh, that's more high frequency that we can get our hands on and touch um, a, a lot sooner. So some of the, uh, the card spending data that our banks publish is, can be very timely and incredibly helpful. Um, retail trade data, for instance, today we get uh, capital expenditure survey from businesses that gives us a bit of a, a read on what businesses are planning for the next year, not just what they're doing right now. So we're very lucky. We, we have lots of different data sets that we track, and, and I have a I say, fabulous team that, um, that track it and do all the analysis. Uh, that means we can advise the board on that. Um, but in terms of what's keeping me up at night, I mean, the, I'm obviously very focused on, on inflation and those inflation dynamics. Um, also very focused on the international environment and how that's evolving and how that impacts us here in Australia. We're not isolated. We are a long way geographically from um, most other countries, but we're not isolated economically. So very focused on um, that global uh, position and, and the dynamics there and what that might mean for us here. Wonderful. Now, I'd like to talk to you about sort of the role of technology and specifically AI. Um, I'm old enough to remember the Alan Greenspan's favorite, famous <laughs> comments about technology productivity and what it meant for yeah. inflation, which proved uh, in hindsight somewhat amiss. Um, but so some of his fundamental points were sort of very much relevant still mm. to today. Mm. Um, to what extent do you as a policymaker and does the board think through those bigger shifts that are occurring uh, that are very much playing out mm -hmm. in business today. Um, AI is obviously at the top of the tree in terms of people thinking about what that may mean for, for jobs, for their own productivity, for their own profitability, all of those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Um, how do you sort of see through all of that and, and mm -hmm. think about well, what should we be thinking about, not just in the immediate term with policy, but on a two, five, ten year horizon? Yeah. Uh, so I probably should say that the RBA, our policy instrument, we don't really have any impact on uh, directly on these trends, so on how AI and other things might play out, but even on um, how uh, they're adopted within businesses and, and things like that. So uh, in terms of specific policies that might be related to that, um, colleagues at the Productivity Commission have done some absolutely fantastic work, and I'd recommend having a look at that. And obviously, uh, the federal government have also got their own agenda. Um, in terms of how we think about it um, and look at it and, and how it comes into our thinking, we're really um, you know, observing those trends. I say we can't influence them, but really thinking about what they mean for the pace of sustainable real wages growth in particular um, and what they mean about the size of the economy and, and our uh, capacity to produce the goods and services um, that we all consume every day. So you know, if we become more productive, all other things equal, then the economy is bigger than it otherwise would be. And I say that's the fundamental for improving living standards, which on a very basic level for the country is, um, is a great outcome. So we're more observing those, those types of trends and how they come through over time. What we can see from history, and uh, it won't be a surprise, <laughs> I'm sure, to say to people that it does take time for these trends to really embed themselves um, in a business. It's not like you sort of invest in your, the cloud uh, technology or you, know, you bring AI into your business and suddenly um, it transforms what you can do and you're twice as productive uh, on day two as you were day one. We know and we can see it does take time to diffuse. It takes time for us all to learn how to use it. Uh, I'm sure we can sympathize with that in our day-to-day -day work. You get a, a new software program and you're better at using it six months uh, down the track than you were on day one. So we know it takes time, typically a couple of years, even longer. So these are very long trends that we're seeing um, and we'll have to observe and see how they play out um, over time. But say, uh, stronger productivity growth is, is a very good thing, uh, all other things equal. And so uh, that's something that I think everyone would like to see. Terrific. Um, as a former journalist, I can ask questions till I'm blue in the face, but I might <laughs> pause now and see if we've got any questions from the floor. I think there's a roving mm. mic. I think Melissa's got one here. If you'd like to ask um, a direct question about interest, interest rates. <laughs> Sarah is ready and willing. <laughs> I'm just interested in the bank's views on the risks of stagflation in Australia, mm. the spectre of higher interest rates and no growth at the same time. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly uh, willing to, to discuss, but perhaps not willing to completely uh, sort of talk about what the board are going to do. I would never speculate on that. But um, in terms of the outlook, um, yeah, look, it's something that we're obviously looking at um, and, um, and considering and mindful of how all of those dynamics come together. So right now, you're right, we do have higher inflation. Obviously, interest rates right now are higher than they have been uh, in the recent past, and, and growth is, uh, has definitely slowed quite markedly. So all of that coming together uh, is our uh, current conditions. Um, I suppose in the context of historically what was stagflation, um, thinking back say, to the 1970s and the early 1980s, that, that is a different time. We did have um, you know, much higher inflation rates then, um, and in some parts, some periods of time there, much slower growth as well. So I'm not sure that we're exactly there now, uh, but we are you know, constantly mindful and watching um, and you know, understanding how our policy settings are having an impact and, and those other trends that are playing through the economy. So uh, just generally observing what's happening and being really uh, forward looking and mindful of the risks, uh, definitely that's all part of the job. Okay. Um, well, I might, if we don't have another question from the floor, I might jump in with another one. Um, commodity prices, mm. you know, key driver of the economy. There's a number of um, individuals in the room who represent mining and natural resources companies. Um, uh, what's the RBA's position in terms of the outlook there? And, and in particular, um, do you have any views around the rise of critical minerals and how that may drive the economy in, in the context of being particularly having historically reliant on, on coal and, and iron ore? Yeah, so, well, so commodity prices, we certainly track them very closely. They're a really important source of income for the economy, for obviously for our mining sector, but it flows back through in terms of um, government revenues and, um, and into the workers in those sectors and what have you. So it's certainly something that we track. And we can see there has been a bit of a rebound um, in the last few months. Uh, some commodity prices more than others. Um, coppers moved quite a bit, for example. Uh, but generally speaking, we have seen a bit of a pickup. And that's actually uh, quite consistent with the, the global outlook, where there has been a little bit of a, a turn and, um, in momentum. It's nothing too too strong, it's not a, uh, anything like a boom, but uh, you know, it's not unexpected that globally you know, momentum made a trough at the end of last year, beginning of this year, and is now picking up a little, and we talked about that in our May SMP. Um, in terms of uh, that structural shift you're talking about, and um, we, we would consider, and we're always very mindful of structural shifts more broadly, yes, we're very actively looking at what the clean energy transition um, means for the economy, how that's going to play through the dynamics of uh, what uh, sectors uh, are they going to be uh, perhaps smaller as a share of GDP uh, over time and which ones are going to grow relatively rapidly because demand for their products is, is going to increase. And so critical minerals are part of that, but obviously there's many, many facets to that. And, and that's certainly uh, going to be something that we'll track very closely over the next you know, five, ten years and beyond that. This is a, not something that happens quickly. It's going to take a bit of time. So, yeah, something we're mindful of um, and, we can, and we're expecting those dynamics to play through. But like everybody else, uh, we'll, um, we'll observe what happens, um, how the world responds to this transition, not just us here, and what that means for our economy. Great. We have another question. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I had two. One is um, in terms of the domestic economy, mm -hmm. you talked about the um, sort of soft slash weak consumer, mm -hmm. um, which um, income brackets, age groups, or other profile is feeling it the most, do you think? Mm -hmm. And the second question is you talk about keeping an eye on the international mm -hmm. landscape. In particular, which country or region mm -hmm. do you monitor most closely mm -hmm. and which aspect of that um, country slash region's economy mm -hmm. um, are you most kind of concerned about and watching yeah. closely? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier the, um, the card spending data that our uh, largest banks now publish. Um, so you can all go and have a look at that. That's um, one of the best sources that we have for that disaggregated uh, household spending. What we can see there is that um, by age, they're, they're reporting that you know, generally younger uh, people are seeing more of a, a squeeze in terms of their spending, and then it, uh, and it sort of cascades up um, through the age brackets from there. But as I said earlier on, um, we uh, think of it in the context of what are the constraints or what's happening to the dynamics around income for, um, and, and what might be driving that and, and explaining it that way rather than linking it to age per se. Um, in terms of the, uh, the international economy and um, what we're monitoring there, 
it won't be surprised to hear that we uh, definitely spend a lot of our time focused on China. It is our largest trading partner by quite some way, and so uh, we do need to understand the dynamics there. Um, and so we have a team that, that uh, focuses on that. Um, and in the context of China in particular, like everyone else, we're, we're certainly looking at balancing out um, what's happening in terms of their um, then at export position and demand for their products, and there's perhaps a bit of strength there from the start of this year. Uh, but we can see domestically um, they've clearly uh, got some uh, weakness, particularly in their property sector and, and the structural change that are happening there, um, but also in terms of consumer spending and, and that returning to a pre-COVID trend. So there's, uh, you know, balances and different uh, pushes and pulls through, uh, through China's economy, and, and we're tracking all of those very closely. Terrific. Um Probably got room, uh, time, I have one more question. Um, just at the back there. Thanks. Um, Sarah, this is Swati from Bloomberg News. Uh, we have seen an increase in the unemployment, youth unemployment rate over the past 18 months. Um, was, what does that say about the labor market and is this a precursor of a marked slowing uh, that might be coming? Mm. Thanks. Yeah, and, and we're tracking all of that information too. Um, so we uh, look at the labor market and think about it uh, very holistically. And so we're really uh, trying to gauge what's happening to what we call full employment. So that's considering the number of people that are working, but also the hours they might be working, um, whether or not people want to work more hours, what's happening to job vacancies, all of that information. So the youth unemployment rate is, is one of many metrics that we track. Um, what we can see generally happening through the labour market that it is uh, softening uh, gradually. And so uh, we're seeing job vacancies track down a little bit. Uh, we are seeing the unemployment rate, the youth unemployment rate, tick up a little bit. Um, the pace of employment growth has, has slowed a little bit. So all of that is consistent with the labour market softening. And as you can see in our latest forecast, we expect that to continue um, you know, in, in a sort of gradual, relatively mild way compared to the previous cycles. Um, and so that's what we're, we're really looking at. And you're absolutely right into earlier questions. As things unfold, if, um, if the speed of that uh, softening changes, it's, it doesn't fully uh, line up with our forecast, then we'll obviously review that and, and update our forecast and our view accordingly. So uh, it's a, a constant game in, um, in our job of uh, tracking what's happening, of adapting, um, updating our view, um, you know, what has played out the way we expected, what hasn't and why. And so bringing all of that together to advise the board on what we think is going to happen going forward, uh, that's the job. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, I might bring uh, this session to a close and, and thank you, Sarah, for what's been a very illuminating and engaging uh, session. Um, it's wonderful to see the RBA uh, has an individual of your capability and experience <laughs> there uh, working on it, so I'd, I somewhat feel more reassured, which is wonderful. <laughs> um, so if you could please join me in thanking, you, thanking Sarah. Thank you.